yes. essentially is one of the aspects yes. of the story and how yeah. painful that um, yes. that is. And well, still I, is. Yeah. I, I assume that most children are the victims of bullying at, at, at one stage and, uh, you know, it's a, it's something you never forget. It's uh, I don't know whether we can ever eradicate bullying, there are anti-bullying campaigns in schools and so on, but children being what they are, they will always learn to evade you know the people who are trying to stop bullying, and uh, and they pick on the weakest uh, children in the community. It's it's very sad. Graham Lay and Kevin Ireland way back then. Before we were ten, New Zealand writers in childhood is a David Ling publication. The heroine of this next book had a truly miserable childhood, being born both a giantess and with a condition where she ages three times faster than the rest of us. Celia Doom, who is both a medical mystery and a very good photographer, is a creation of award-winning novelist, poet and short story writer Laura Solomon, based in Nelson and published in the UK. Gail Woods reads from An Imitation of Life. Sometime after my third birthday, when I was four foot in height and weighed 70 kilos, Letty decided that it was time for me to be taken to the hospital for a check-up. She didn't bother making an appointment. She shoved me in the back of the car and whipped me down to A&E, knowing that the sight of me would be enough to secure some instant attention. At the hospital, they stared and stared. I was given priority treatment. Forget the stabbed men with punctured lungs, the old codgers in the grip of heart attacks, the women who were miscarrying. I was number one. I came first me and my big body and my black and white eyes and my fangs and my shock of colourless hair were whipped straight to the front of the queue. Barry and Letty were left to sit in the waiting room and I was led into a stark white room, told to strip naked and lay down on the table. Three humans in white coats stared down at me. I was a lab specimen, an etherised bug. They did not talk to me, they spoke about me in whispers. They did not speak my name. They referred to me first as it, and then, after I lashed out and bit one of them on the leg, as the vicious it. As I was coming to know Celia, Laura, I I couldn't help thinking that she's kind of the opposite of the usual heroine, isn't she? The usual heroine is beautiful and lithe, and Celia has everything going against her. How did you conceive of her? Actually, what I had in mind was I wanted to write a picaresque, which, for listeners who don't know, is where a hero or heroine, but sometimes somebody who is a bit of a rogue, goes through a series of episodic adventures. So my main inspiration was Nights at the Circus, which is an Angela Carter novel with the big heroine Feathers, where she's really over the top. So I wanted a heroine who is really over the top, but spoke to, I mean, all women feel a bit ugly sometimes, So I wanted to speak to that side of women, the side that feels like locked out and ugly and unattractive. So I sort of took all these characteristics and inflated it. And she's one of those interesting characters because things have gone against her, you know, her looks have gone, her freakishness, as she calls it, has gone against her. You know, she creates misery as as her life goes along. But would she have done that if the world had treated her more kindly? It's one of those conundrums. Well, there is a bit of analogy there, sort of like if you think of something like Edward Scissorhands where he's got these big scissors for hands, but he creates beautiful art. So it's, you know, it's a similar thing to that. Here's somebody who is really ugly and a misfit and just does not fit into society, but is a very good photographer and actually gets by on her photography. And this is based, as an extreme example, of a condition, progeria. Yes, she's got um, an ageing condition called progeria, which normally occurs in dwarfs where she ages faster than everybody else. I've got her ageing three times as fast as everybody else. I'm not sure that that would actually happen, but there is an actual condition called progeria, where you age very quickly. You give us an update on, or she gives us an update on her birthdays in terms of her size. Sometime after my third birthday, when I was four foot in height and weighed 70 kilos, you know, you, you build this picture of her in your mind. I mean, how did you come up with Celia? As I say, I was very inspired by Knights of the Circus and I did want to do something with this big over-the-top heroine. Then I read two other Paul Theroux novels, Milroy the Magician, where you've got a, a magician character, so that sort of fed into the character of Uncle Ed. And to credit Paul Theroux again, he's got a novel called Picture Palace, where you've got a photographer. So all those elements fed into it and then it was my own imagination acting on it as well. As you say, photography, she describes it, photography would fill the blank space where I should have been. It's an interesting career. Often photographers are invisible. She, of course, is the opposite of invisible. And yet, as you say, she has this gift 
for photography? Yes, well, she wants to be invisible. I mean, I think she craves being anonymous and just sort of lurking about. But of course, she can never hide just because of her size. She's always going to stand out. Very few people love Celia, and two of those who cared for her, essentially her, her parents, die uh, and die horribly. Yes, well, she's quite alone in the world. She's also got these grandmothers who are, you know, are quite friendly towards her and quite welcoming and sort of welcome her into the family, even though she's not actually... Well, actually, she sort of is a blood relative, but they don't realise she's a blood relative. And so she's got them, and she's sort of adopted in a way by Ian Giannati, who exploit her, um, which is a theme I wanted to explore, sort of exploitation of the artist by what you might call unscrupulous parties. So in a way they take care of her, but they're also just sort of like using her for her talent, you know, to make themselves as well. She also has terrible taste in men. Yes, she does. Mm. I mean, they exploit her as well, really, don't they? Well, you've got Ed, who is a bit flaky. I mean, he's not really a presence in her life. He's her uncle. And he's the one who gives her a gift of a camera, but he's not really willing to be that involved in her life. He's off doing magic tricks and doing this and that, and he's not really much of a support or a steadying influence for her. And then you have Augustus Vitra, which is when uh, Celia gets shipped off to the capital, which is the uh, main city, and he's also pretty creepy. He's an embalmer. He works in a funeral parlour. He makes Celia do nude modelling for him. So there is a bit of a theme of sort of exploitation of women in there and exploitation of artists as well. The medical profession was explored in this too, Laura. I mean, of course, somebody like Celia becomes a fascination for the medical people. And you write here, the medical men, um, their word was gospel, their truth was absolute, and what they want to do was tag her and probe her. And it's a horrendous way to feel, being treated like a medical freak like that. It's no wonder that she hurts in the way that she does. Well, yeah, I mean, I did think that somebody like that, the chances might be that you know, sometimes people attract sort of unwelcome interest and she doesn't really want to be a lab specimen. She doesn't really want to be poked and prodded and mauled and yet they're always sort of like after her because she's a curiosity and there's sort of a freak show element to her. And so they're always hoping to sort of document and categorise her and understand. And, um, yeah, I don't think she likes that part of it much. You clearly have a fondness for her, though, Laura, as you go go through, having created her, having thrown so many obstacles and in her way? Well, I really enjoyed creating Celia, and the book just flowed effortlessly. I mean, I wrote it over the course of about a year. It was pretty much effortless to write and just pretty much dictated itself to me, obviously, with these other things I've been thinking about going on. Um, I read a a lot about photography, and it was a struggle to get this novel published. I mean, I actually wrote this book when I was 24, and then there were various ins and outs with it, and in the end, I just shelved it and wrote short stories and once I had like a bit of acceptance as a short story writer in the UK I was able to get a novel published and by that stage I'd completely moved away from Celia and moved on to completely different pastures but she is one of my favourite characters just because she's so over the top and I hope that people can sort of relate to her even though she is over the top I can hope that they can, everybody can a little bit relate to sort of being the outcast and you know not being wanted and things like that. You mentioned the UK there, Laura. Of course, you've had a, a, an awful lot of success overseas as well. What what else is going on in your life at the moment? I've won a prize which is still confidential, so I can't tell you what it is. Um, I've been shortlisted for the Virginia Prize, although I may have to withdraw. Um, that's judged by Faye Weldon. So I've ma- I just found out this morning, actually, um, I've made the, the shortlist of five out of 120. An Imitation of Life by Laura Solomon is published by Solidist.